Hi, everybody. Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is studio designer Hanson Sue. He'll talk about some state-of-the-art acoustics, but he's going to make it really easy for you to understand. But first, I'd like to talk about the Billboard 200 album charts. Everything in the music business has been based around the album charts for, oh, 20-some years? Since 1991, actually. It was all based around Nielsen SoundScan. And Nielsen SoundScan was the system that actually scanned the barcodes when someone purchased a CD at retail. And that's how the charts were made up. Before 1991, it was pretty flaky, actually, the way they determined what the charts were going to be, because what they did is they called around to different music stores and they asked, what's selling? And of course, it's really easy for someone who happens to like an act or was paid by a record label to say, oh yeah, Tom Petty's selling better than anything else, or you know, pick your artist. When SoundScan came in in 1991, that pretty much eliminated that, which was a good thing. The problem is the way the charts are determined right now is pretty much outdated. But you have to give Billboard credit because they do try to keep up with whatever the latest is in technology. And what they've done is they've incorporated streams, finally, into the Billboard 200 charts. What this means is they're going to measure the streams from Spotify, Beats Music, Google Play, and even Xbox Music to determine the chart ranking of a particular album. And of course, this is a great, great thing, because now it's actually so much fairer than it was last week, for instance. So one of the things that's interesting is it still looks like it's based around sales, but they have a determining factor. Basically, they equate 10 downloads to one album sale, and they equate 1,500 streams to one album sale as well. And you might say, how they figure 1,500 streams? Well, Spotify, for instance, and and actually any kind of non-interactive streaming service pays a royalty of 0.007 cents. So in other words, seven-tenths of a cent. And if you multiply that by 1,500, you get about 10 bucks. It's not quite as easy to determine that because actually that's on the paid tier, 0.007 cents for a paid stream. What happens if you're on the free tier? Well, in fact, that still pays, but it pays 0.004, 0.005 cents. And this sounds pretty good, but the fact of the matter is, you never really know exactly how much that's paying out because it's different in different countries. And there are some situations, mobile situations, for instance, where you might not get paid at all. So this 1,500 streams is the equivalent of one album sale, but it's not quite the equivalent of a $10 album sale, which is one of the reasons why artists have trouble with their royalty payments from streams, because they'll say, well, wait a second, I had 3 million streams of this particular song, and I only got 30 bucks. Well, there's a couple things that goes into this. The first of all is, what kind of streams were they, and how did they pay the royalty? Were they paying it on the free tier Were they paying it more on the paid tier? Or what happens if a lot of this is from outside the country, or they're paying even less, or none at all? So then there's another factor in that the money goes to the record label first, and then it goes to the artist. So what ends up happening is record labels are very, very good at keeping money and not paying royalties that are owed to artists. They've always been really good at it, and they'll always be that way. So that's why the money doesn't necessarily trickle down. That being said, still there's more and more money being made from streams and that's a really good thing. One of the things that's come out this year is that there's been 100 billion streams listened to so far in 2014. 100 billion with a B. And that's only going to grow, which means there's going to be more and more money into artists' pocketbooks, songwriters, publishers, and record labels. It's a good thing. The next thing I want to talk about is something that I feel that I have to bring up, even though I'm probably the least likely person to do so. And that's, I want to defend Mariah Carey. Now, 
Mariah is not my favorite vocalist because I'm not really crazy about her style of vocal gymnastics. I understand a lot of people really like it, but for me, I like people that sing a melody and don't drift too far off of it. Unfortunately, it's hard to find a melody in her song because she's all over the place. Now, that's my taste. That being said, something happened the other day that I think should be commented on, and I want to defend her. Mariah sings every year at the NBC Lighting of the Christmas Tree at Rockefeller Center in New York. This has been a traditional thing now. She's done it for a number of years. And it becomes a TV special as well. And the other day, she was three hours late. There's no excuse for being late. But once she got on stage and sang, she was skewered by the critics, by the press the next day, about what a terrible and horrible performance it was and how off-key she was and just terrible. So I went and listened. And I didn't think it was that bad at all. And when she was off, I think I have a number of reasons why that happened. First of all, here's a woman that's at her attorney's office at a divorce settlement meeting. Now, there's no excuse for keeping your audience waiting. That being said, she goes cold right on stage. So she doesn't have time to warm up. And any vocalist will tell you they need time to warm up. Most of them need about an hour until they feel good, until they can start to hit all the high notes. So she goes right on stage, and of course she can't hit the high notes. She tries really hard. She can't hit them, but she's not that far off. So that's one thing. The second thing is it was cold, and there was a cold rain coming down. And again, Every musician hates playing or singing in the cold. Your muscles constrict in order to save energy, and it makes it really difficult to perform. I have to say, I have to give her props. That was a terrific thing to even try to do, considering how cold it was. Because a lot of performers wouldn't have done that. They would have played to uh, pre-record. We've seen this actually from great musicians. If you go back to 2009, at the first Obama inauguration, you had Yo-Yo Ma, who's one of the greatest classical performers ever, who had to play to a pre-record since it was so cold. And we had some great performers that day that did not perform because of that. So just the fact that she tried, I think, is in her favor. The third thing is, once again, everyone will tell you if you have a bad monitor mix, a bad in-ear mix, you're not going to perform your best. I don't know this for a fact, but it's entirely possible she didn't have a sound check and she went in cold. And of course, if you can't hear what you're cueing off of, it's near impossible to really give a great performance. Now, that being said, if you seek out the performance on YouTube and listen to it, it's really not bad at all. It's pretty good considering the circumstances. So why she got skewered in the press, I don't know. I wrote something in Forbes actually defending her and it got, as of now, 160,000 views, which is far more than I usually get. And basically that was because I was the only one defending her. Now, once again, I'm not a big fan of her style of music, but hey, fair is fair. So I'm just calling it as I see it. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Don't forget about my new coaching program, which is 101 Mixing Tricks, big studio tricks for the small studio. You can go to 101mixingtricks.com to learn more. That's 101mixingtricks.com. My guest today is Hanson Sue, who's really involved in some cutting-edge room measurements and acoustics. Hanson's one of the few people to question some of the long-accepted practices in room design. And he's made a number of breakthroughs as a result that you're going to hear about in just a little bit. And I got to tell you, I'm really impressed with some of the things he's doing. And I think you will be after you hear this as well. I spoke with Hanson, who was in his office, and we spoke via Skype. So Hanson, thanks so much for being on my inner circle today. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Bobby. I'm honored to be here. So... How does a kid from upstate New York wind up being one of the best designers in Los Angeles? How did that happen? Well, um, upstate New York was really cold. And at the time, I was really into rock and roll. But um, I was married. And my ex-wife said, take me somewhere warm or I'll kill you. So 
back in the day as it and it pretty much as now you know the recording industry was um new york nashville and la but we decided that um because we've been to la a couple times i'd been a few times that la was the perfect blend of weather culture you know rock and roll entertainment industry it had more it had film television music it had you know many more facets of audio for the entertainment industry and um we drove cross country came out here and i just got into everything film television music live concerts everything and one thing just led to another and i just kept in very 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 brief description um i kept looking for the next harder thing building studios from at what's like audio you know tape machines and consoles that was fascinating and then the next fascinating thing was building dub stages and then the next fascinating thing which is at the time was considered and still is to some voodoo was acoustics and once i found how hard and how challenging and how incredibly impactful it is to all humans i was hooked i was like oh this is hard and when it's right it's unbelievable when it's wrong it's awful and not a lot of people know how to do it well and i was just hooked i just could not stop thinking about it let's jump back for a second because you mentioned that uh you started at Westlake, right? Um, in L.A., I actually started working for UCLA doing live music at Royce Hall and Wadsworth Theater doing the um, – every month it was uh, Sunday jazz concerts. So I did uh, live, live audio and worked for Schubert Systems and worked for Maryland Sound and did a lot of live sounds. Yeah, worked for Maryland Sound, Schubert Systems, Best Audio. Do you remember Best Audio? Ben? I do, yes. Yes, yeah. man. And then um, – did a lot of touring and then, you know, worked at Irvine Meadows, worked at the Whiskey, worked at the Roxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just doing live front of house and monitors and then really wanted to get into uh, studios and then started at Westlake. Yeah, that was a, my first long stint singular job in audio. Yeah. Now, did you start designing studios at Westlake? How, how did you get into designing? I mean, how does someone who's doing live sound get into acoustics first of all and and you mentioned dub stages so we and you started there that which is an unusual place really <laughs> well um i was doing live sound and as you know the live sound world is um well it's not conducive to a relationship because you're never home yeah and i was married at the time and that just didn't work uh, I'm sorry, not the marriage didn't work, but being married and trying to be on a rock and roll tour all the time just didn't work. So we agreed that I would stay home, but that meant you got to find another gig, you know. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find a, a rock and roll gig where it's like, oh, well, we want to do 200 dates in one place besides Vegas, right? Yeah. Um, so I started looking for a gig in, in recording studios, and plus I wanted to do album work versus live work. It just it appealed to me. So I had some friends at A&M, and I just canvassed the streets, and um, I, I looked at my old mentor, Freddie Bova. from He used to be chief at Clinton Recording in New York, and he and his buddy over at A&M, they hooked me up with a, a, a tech position over at Westlake. And I basically worked my way up there and got fascinated by studios. Uh, as you well know, album work and recording is very different than live. And back in the day, it was completely different. You know, we weren't dragging, you know, hard drives and, you know, we weren't dragging large consoles. It was, it was different. Yeah. It was different. And then building, uh, you know, working in a recording studio, I got fascinated by obviously the technology, the electronics, the man-made parts of it, the electronics, the console, the tape machines, Studer 800s, Neves and SSLs. That was a blast. But of course, nature is the best, is the most amazing creator, is the is the genius in our world. And when I realized that the really beautiful part of music, besides the content, the, the music itself, the artist, is the sound, is how the sound moves through air and how complicated and how mysterious and how beautiful it can be. I started spending as much time as I could with Glenn Phoenix, the owner of Westlake, who was a great mentor of mine. And spent a lot of time tuning runes and spent a lot of time banging on metal panels and 
hooting and hollering into little spaces, getting things to rattle and getting rid of noises and rattles. And, and, you know, he mentored me well, he, he taught me a lot of great things. And I was, I was kind of hooked. I'm like, wow, this isn't a call someone up at Neve and figure out the schematic. This is nature made air, nature made sound, and no one really understands it completely. It's like the rock and roll guy's version of evolutionary biology. (laughs) You know, it's like we don't really know exactly how it works. We know kind of how it works. We don't have all the secrets, but it's really fascinating. Without it, we have no music. It's at the core. If we don't have air and sound, there's no music. Yeah. yeah. And so, and to this day, I'm still obsessed. You can ask my staff. I spend lots and lots of time doing research on thermodynamics and Oh, quantum acoustics and uh, quantum physics and air molecules and, and chemistry and, and evolutionary biology. So I got sucked into it from recording studios because it was the next harder, more, more challenging thing, the big mysterious thing. Um, of course, we were doing a lot of great music at Westlake, and that was always beautiful. But as, some, as all of us decided at one point we were not going to be rock and roll stars or opera singers, it's like, okay, well, how do I stay near the music? if I'm not good enough to do the music itself and do something interesting. And then once I started getting my teeth, you know, cutting my teeth in acoustics, it just got more and more fascinating and more and more intriguing. Well, what's interesting to me, well, okay, let's go back to the dubbing stage because you mentioned that you did dubbing stages first before you you really did recording studios. Is that the way? Uh, I did music studios first. Okay. All right. I said that out of order. And that's a natural evolution is, I remember thinking at my time, it was like we had built a bunch of rooms. We had, you know, solved a bunch of problems. Glenn had taught me a lot. We put in a lot of consoles. We'd done a lot of acoustics. And there comes a point where, you know, realistically, economically, from a business point of view, and just logistically, we had pretty much gone through all the rooms at Westlake, and they were working great. They were sounding great. And and then I thought, well, what's the next, what's the next step? What, besides building some of the world's best recording studios, what's the next step in acoustics? And I thought, naturally, well, film, because it's a different animal. There's more transducers. There's more point sources. There are more objects. The consoles are bigger. The number of tracks is larger. And the rooms are bigger. And they, they behave differently. And so I got fascinated by that and moved to Sony Pictures and ended up working on the remodel of the Cary Grant Theater in the late 99, like 99, 2000, right around there. And that was, that was a project that took a pint of blood out of me. That was a pretty fast, that was about a nine month project we did in three months. Whoa. It was a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of fun. We had a, a great time with that. It's still the last incarnation of that, which we built in 99, 2000 still stands today, still stands today. And it's beautiful. It's very art deco. It's gorgeous. You did one of my fav- favorite studios. I, I, well, we've both been in studios all over the world, lots of them. And I think this was one of my top five. And it's uh, Woodshed Studios for Richard Gibbs. Uh, Woodshed, yeah, Richard. He's a dear friend. Um, truth be told, I actually didn't design that. We, we come in and help Richard when he needs um, modifications. So um, there was a point in time where... Uh, he has a lot of different clients who come in, and we advise him and we consult for him. So when he met, uh, when we met through his wife's best friend, um, he had already built his beautiful place, um, but it was it was designed as a composer's room. Yeah, it was designed as this beautiful, many windowed, gorgeous, natural daylight hardwood spot overlooking Malibu in the ocean. Um, of course, when you really want to do critical mixing, um, you know, it can be a little sloppy for some people, a little bouncy. So when he had you two come in, he called me and said, Hey, I need, I got 36 hours to turn my one room in my house, the pool room, we're going to take the pool table out and I need you to turn it into a control room quality, <laughs> control room quality room. <laughs> Luckily we had just perfected some of our, um, quantum acoustics, zero acoustics panels. And so we set up a control room in his pool room. We removed the pool table and made some glass disappear, but like orally made it disappear. And we uh, treated his, um, his mix room with some panels as well. 
And everybody was very happy. You know, Declan was very happy, and the and the guys were very happy with it. It was a huge challenge. We had 36 hours over a weekend to whip up a solution for an impossible. You know, here's lots and lots and lots and lots of glass, and here's another room that's in a house with lots and lots and lots of glass, and here's you know not enough time and not enough money. Go. <laughs> and it worked out really well. We're, the client was very happy. Richard was very happy. Uh, I guess Bono sung straight uh, into some of our panels for almost like a week straight, and the tracks came out great. So, you know, my client's happy, his client's happy, and the artist is happy. That's my definition of success. Yeah, yeah. You know, I only heard good things about the way it went over there because uh, I'm tight with Richard as well, so we speak yeah, often. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's a great yeah. guy. Tell me about uh, ZR Acoustics. How did that come about? ZR Acoustics um, dates back to mid 2000s. Um, the the late great, God rest his soul, Mike Shipley, our dear friend Mike Shipley, was referred to us by Rich Nevins, who had just uh, the world was just changing to the Icon. The Icon had just come out. Um, Pro Tools had just made their first console, and everyone's like, hmm. And I got a call from Rich Nevins saying. Do you remember Mike Shipley from Westlake? I'm like, yeah, of course. He did a ton of, you know, Def Leppard stuff and a lot of work at Westlake. He said, well, I have a challenge for you. He's got, he's getting divorced. He's got a new girlfriend. He's leaving Mutt Lang's place. He's walked away from Shania. He's starting, he's, he's starting his own thing. He bought a house in Studio City and he wants to convert all the rooms into audio rooms. And he wants a different kind of room. And I went, well, I'll meet with him, but at that time, we were still doing the same traditional style acoustic designs as everyone else. And Mike is super nice and super, super amiable and, and remembered me and we were, we were just catching up. And he sits me down in basically a smallish, uh, like a living room, like a California style living room. That's like the living rooms open into like the kitchen area. It's like an L-shaped area, right? Mm-hmm. right. It's fairly large. And he says, well, see this area over here? He's like, I just want to block off this rectangle and put a studio in here. And I said... Well, yeah, but once you start angling the walls and everything and putting a cloud in here and, you know, putting a, a W in the front and a V in the back, you're not going to have a lot of space. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do any of that. He's like, you know, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> As every client loves to say, figure it out. I'm like, hmm. So I went back to my drawing boards and I'm just sitting in front of my drawing boards thinking, I am, I'm dead. I'm fired. I, he wants a he wants something that sounds like Mutt Lang Studio in upstate New York, or Westlake Audio, or Record Plant, or The Village. But he wants it rectangular. And I thought, Rich is going to kill me, and everyone's going to hate me because I'm going to let Mike Shipley down. And then, after staring at a blank drafting table for about three days, I came up with the idea for ZR Acoustics, was which was, well, start at the beginning. Ask every question, why? Why do we angle walls? Why do we have trapezoidal rooms? Why do we have clouds? Why do we use absorptive surfaces? Why do we use a certain kind of, why do we use dry? Every single thing we did to that time, everything that everyone did in traditional acoustics to that point in time, I've been doing what everyone does. Is like I learned from the, from the best, but I never spent a lot of time delving into the exact science and physics of why. In short, we went to the why of everything, every material science. Why drywall? What is drywall? How is it made? Why angle surfaces? What does that do? Why resonances, comb filtering, base buildup in corners, everything. And when we broke down all the whys, I came up with an idea as to how to do the same things, but just denser, thinner, and more aesthetically in any shape or form. And once we figured out that, acoustical mathematical paradigm, we realize that it applies to everything. It's, it applies anywhere, any shape, size, or room. It doesn't matter. It's a lot of mathematics, and with anything musical, it's also a lot of creativity. But it basically has to do with two things. One, acoustic resolution, just like resolution in any part of nature, is key. Resolution trumps everything. It trumps materials. It trumps geometry. It trumps everything. Secondly, geometry is critical, but not more important than resolution. So those two things can eradicate resonances. They can eradicate standing waves. They can almost eliminate comb filtering. 
but you have to have the right math of resolution, enough resolution, high resolution. Well, well wait, define resolution in this case, because you're talking about acoustic resolution. What, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Exactly. And that's an excellent question. So we have quantified acoustic resolution um, kind of to make a metaphor to sampling. So sampling, when they first created sampling, they realized that two samples per second was the minimum that you needed. You know, you needed it was like it's like film or something somewhere around there. I don't remember the exact numbers, but, you know, originally remember when we had like uh, 32K sampling. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so then on the CDs, which were the longest ruling, you know, format, 44, 116 bit, they they figured out how many samples per second. And so when we asked the question, why do we do what we do? The question came back not to acoustics, not to music, but to science, which is to say, if the thing that we know so well, which is samples per second at X bit rate, 44.1 at 16 bit, why do we not and why has no one quantified that in acoustics? To, to my knowledge, it's no one has said this many X in this quantification Y equals this resolution. And we did a bunch of reasons. I mean, there's tons of mathematics and acoustics, of course. But we realized, okay, we, we quantified it. We said, take one square foot. There's an easy quantification that every construction guy in the world can deal with, every contractor, every architect. One square foot. In one square foot, how many non-parallel surfaces... In other words, if you had two walls facing each other and they were perfectly parallel, like the tines of a tuning fork, how many non-parallel surfaces, take those two walls and angle them away from each other, how many of those per square foot do you have? Now, there's a measure. You ignore the floor because generally, for many, many reasons, gravity, walking, code, it has to be flat or stepped, right? So ignore the floor. You have typically in a room four walls and a ceiling. Depending upon the shape of the room, it could be more, but that's your baseline. Four walls and a ceiling. You add up all the square footage of all four of those walls and the ceiling, and that gives you your total square foot. You count the number of non-parallel surfaces. So in a traditional studio, the left-hand and right-hand walls are usually angled, you know, flaring away from each other towards the front, mm-hmm. like a V. So if you're sitting at the back of the room, it looks like a big V flaring away from you. And then the front of the room is either multifaceted like a like a bay window or a w or v and that's one two three four five more like surfaces or facets like the facet of a diamond or a uh, eye a mosquito and then the back has like maybe three more so five across the front three across the back that's eight left and right nine and ten and then a cloud on the ceiling called that eleven when you divide that by all the square footage you end up with a what we call an acoustic resolution of a 0.01 non-parallel surfaces per square foot. We call it NPS. It's like NPR, the radio station, only NPS. Yeah, yeah. Non-parallel surfaces slash per square foot. 0.01 is like 32K or less, you know, sampling rate in our world. The, the original ZR Acoustics was 0.56. It's 56 times the acoustic resolution of a traditional studio, which is why it's so dramatically, noticeably different. Um, so it'd be like taking 48K in our current world and multi- multiplying it 56 times. You know, we, we do 48K, you know, 96K and 192. That's a quadrupling. Yeah, yeah. And that changes, I mean, that's starting to really approach the sound of analog. Yeah. Multiply that by another 52 times, you're into the gigahertz. and. Yeah. You know, storage, digital, anyway, it would sound amazing and hard drives would be massive. Yeah. You know, so that's what we did and we've increased it since then. So non-parallel surfaces, NPS per square foot. The original ZR was 0.56. The new panels, these micro panels are 140. Wow. The sample rate 8-bit panels, these right here, are 450. And we're working on a panel right now that per square foot, and I know this number is going to sound ridiculous, but we're, we're prototyping it right now. Per square foot, we're going to have 36,864 non-parallel surfaces. Wow. And if, we're, if we can get it to work, it'll be stamped anodized aluminum and it'll be a half inch thick. Jeez. So practically speaking, what you're saying is you can take these panels, put them in a room, and basically without doing much more than that you get 
something that's way, way better acoustically by, ju- by our, just doing the panels, right? That is what our clients tell us. What the clients tell us is that we have crossed we have crossed the threshold for the first time in history with extremely high acoustic resolution panels, our quantum technology ZR acoustics panels. You can, with surface treatment only, you can exceed the performance of a purpose-built room. Wow. So for the first time, you know, we have one client who has 50% coverage of his walls with uh, ZR acoustics products. Only 50% coverage. And his performance is exactly the same as universal mastering, according to him. He's been in both rooms many times. And that basically means surface treatment beats the envelope. So meaning if we covered every square inch and we treated 100% of his room with products, with ZR technology, then we would exceed the room. Of course, if you took a purpose-built room and you built the same technology into the walls and you know, permanently, it would, of course, perform the same. The difference is the product hangs on the wall like an art piece or, you know, like an art frame, and you can take it with you, you can move it around, that sort of thing. So, yes, that's what our clientele are telling us from the, from the listening tests and all the testing we've done today. Well, is that what Universal Mastering did? Because it's basically, they have, you know, a rectangle. There doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a purpose-built room in, in there. Oh, those, that, are all, those are all purpose-built rooms, yes. They are? Because... They're all right, but um, they don't have the typical look of a purpose-built room, just like you were talking about before, with the, the V in the one side and the W on the other. Um, it doesn't, unless it's a very, very slight uh, angle, you don't see the, the sloped walls. This but, is true. Um, that is a purpose-built room. We were limited. We were handed a blueprint and said, you have this area in the center. So the vice president at the time, Paul, he handed us a blueprint and said everything around the outside, which we, we called the donut, was already allocated to offices and kitchens and storage and all that. And everything in the middle, which was cut right, uh, everything in the middle, which we called the donut hole, um, which ended up being about 2,000, 3,000 square feet, was was bisected right down the middle with three columns that held up the entire roof of the building. Oh, yeah. So, and they wanted what they ended up with seven rooms. They wanted as many rooms as possible. So the only way to get it because of the shape of the existing blueprint and the hallways was to give them rectangles. So we gave them what they needed. We ran the blueprints through, you know, the powers that be, the upper management, and it just came out to a bunch of rectangles. Also because they had limitations in furniture and desks and that sort of, and the smaller the rooms got <clears throat> putting a curved desk or a round table into a 10 by 14 room doesn't really lead itself to efficiency very well from an interior point of view and a working point of view. So it is a purpose built room. Those are actually seismically engineered for a 6.8 earthquake. So if that building fell down on top of the studios, the studios would stand tall and strong and it'd be the safest place in the building. They are full construction. They are full, but they are rectangular. Since then, we've done semicircular glass rooms. We've done rectangular rooms, square rooms, cube rooms. The, the paradigm works anywhere. It doesn't really matter what the size or shape of the room is. Which is pretty amazing because a square a square room is the worst of all possible scenarios. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if you can make that work, then just about anything else is so much easier, right? Yes, exactly. Well, I mean... Actually, the hardest room we ever did to date was the semicircular glass room because it basically looked like a microwave dish made out of glass. You know, it was a perfect concave reflector aiming right at the back center back of the room. That one was hard, but when we got it done, we were, we were very happy. You can literally put speakers in front of the glass and not hear it. Um, but to make a metaphor to our industry, to, you know, sound, it's kind of like saying, well, once you've figured out how to make a microphone, you can make a small one, you can make a big one, you can make a large diaphragm one, you can make a, you know, you can make a powered one, you can make a phantom powered one, you can make a 57, you can make a Telefunken 150. It's a transducer, you know? And once you figure figured out the transducer, the microphone, a headphone's the next step. And once you figure out the headphone, the speaker's the next step. It doesn't matter. I can make a, a huge... Claire Brothers tower of line arrays, or I can make a tiny little computer speaker. It's in essence the same thing. When you back out of the audio industry 
and you go to nature and science. It's the paradigm at the base of it. It's the math and science at the base of it that allows you to translate it into anything, into anything. Your guitars, I see your guitars down there. Yeah. You know, a guitar string is essentially the same thing as a bass string, is essentially the same thing as a violin string. It's a, it's a taut string at a certain pitch. Once you do that, you can figure it out. It's just like, it's just extending the science from nature outward, which always gives us the best solutions. Very cool. I, I've, I was looking at your site and I saw something called Nomad Arc Structures. What's that about? <laughs> well, Nomad Arc is um, the second firm that we have. It's called Nomad Arc. It stands for Nomadic Architecture. It is, um, it is a business rooted in prefabricated, modular, but transportable buildings for either residential or commercial. Now, when you first look at the image, the one online is actually clad in man-made stone, the first stone to be made by man ever, by Cosentino Tile out of Spain. Um, that's an up, optional upgrade. But they're basically made in a building so you fix your price. They're very high-end buildings with Mila appliances and Velux skylights and chef's kitchens and hardwood floors. And they're beautiful buildings that are normally valued at $500 a square foot with chef's kitchens and they're high end structures. But because we make them in a factory, it's like making, uh, I don't know, tall funky 251s in a factory or not. Yeah. It's like a beautiful, beautiful microphone, but you can keep your costs limited because there's no, Oh, it rained today. So my contractor is going to charge me 10% more. The no matter concept is rooted in being able to have the freedom to move, to transport it. So we have a transportable foundation and transportable build building. And you separate out the land from the building now. So you can lease a plot of land, which is a very age-old sociological paradigm across the world. Hong Kong, China, Every Walmart, every Kmart, every single Home Depot, every Sam's Club is all leased land. In fact, half of the condominium complexes are all leased land for 50 or 100 years. The building no longer is valued tied to the land. Oh, I have a great house, but it's in Watts, so it's not worth as much. Take the same house, put it in Long Beach or in Venice, and boy, it's worth six times what it was. No, this beautiful house is the same value no matter where you move it. You get a 10-year lease. You live on the beach, you know, great. Then you get married and you have a bunch of kids. Wait, let's move to a different um, school zone. Let's just take the house apart and move it to a different zip code, rent a piece of land there. The kids go to school through their teenage years. They go to college. Well, great. Now the kids are in college. Take the thing apart. Let's move it to Idaho near the near Sun Valley and we'll go skiing until the kids get out of college and have kids. Then move back to the beach because then we have grandkids that want to be on the beach. It's freedom of lifestyle like your car isn't tied to a parking spot. Why should your building be? And to make a funny link, the whole reason it came about is because I've never been a fan of prefab housing because it always, it doesn't look very good. It doesn't feel very solid. It seems expensive. You could build one cheaper out of stick construction. And then one day I just kind of got annoyed because my friends in rock and roll and my friends at Claire Brothers, all my friends on the road, I went, you know, when I was on the road, we would set up a city, basically a full-on light, sound, costumes, actors, guitars, PA, everything, power, generation, you know, everything. We'd set it up in a day. You know, Michael Jackson had, on his last tour, he had, I don't know, what was it? It was like over 100 tractor trailers, and they would set it up in like a day. Yeah. Set up a, why can't we build a building? It's the same technology. Why can't we build a building that can be taken apart and reassembled? maybe 10 times in 100 years yeah. when we do it every single day for 365 days a year. And not just one company, but many companies know how to do this. Road cases, sister lugs, latches, connectors, it's all there. And so we, we created this idea of affordable, transportable housing and offices at about $230 a square foot. Jeez. Wow. So a 3,700-square-foot structure the building actually costs eight seventy five. Are there zoning problems with that? Um, there's no zoning problems, but every different area has rules for what they call factory built housing. Yeah. So the good news is that again, nothing we're doing with Nomad Arc is is out of the paradigm of existing rules and regulations. Every state and federally, they have rules and regulations for what they call factory built housing. 
And so that's not a problem. We're just putting it in a different business model, making the building look more beautiful, giving you the freedom to transport it and creating an infrastructure around it. And it's currently represented exclusively by Sotheby's. So, and we're having a lot of fun with it. It's very cool. It's a great idea. Let's get back to acoustics for a second. Um, how much of what you do is, would you consider a science and how much is an art? Well, you know, the old classic joke, I think it's 99% of art is science and 1% is creativity. Yeah. Um, I think I've been saying for the last 10 years that it's more like 90-10. Um, do you remember when uh, keyboards first came out? I'm sure. oh, sorry, electronic keyboards. Yeah. And everybody hated the sound of them because they were so perfectly pitched that they drove us nuts. And then there was a whole bunch of guys running around detuning your electric keyboards until, yeah. until everyone figured out how to build this keyboard that sounded more natural. It's exactly that. So we do the science. We do 130% science. We do the math to the nth degree and then a little more just to make sure we did it right. And sometimes we tear it apart in the middle of a design and do it again. It's not... It's extremely common for me to get to version 18 of a design and throw it all away, start again, and I'll end up at version 32 before I'm done. So I basically do it twice. We do the science. We do it to the nth degree. We do it exhaustingly until we're confident that science is right. Then we modify it with the creative sound, which is means we, we oralize it. We, we acoustically visualize it as if we were listening to music in the room. Not, oh, this is perfect mathematically, but okay, well, if I'm like a typical recording engineer and I'm going to sit at the console the whole time, but a lot of times I'm going to you know, lean in my chair to the left or the right, and I'm not going to be on center. Well, we design it for a wider sweet spot, so not just the one-foot square. Our, our rooms are well known to have wall-to-wall sweet spots. You can stand, you can sit, you can be anywhere in the room. So sociologically and psychologically, we look at, well, how do people sit? People rarely sit up straight. Like like you're leaning forward. I'm leaning forward, yeah. Other people slump back or other people hunch forward. Some, a lot of people lean to the left and lean on one arm or the other arm. Or a lot of people sit on the couch or some people stand up a lot. So we design for that. And we also design for the music. It's... We're not designing for a microphone. We're not designing for a robot. We're designing music for humans. We want the, the room should basically vanish. Our goal and our single goal is to have everything sound as if you were sitting in the room with the artist at the moment that they played the sound. The, and, and the goal of the recording industry is that exact same transparency. So the best compliment we ever had, and I wish I could remember which client said it, because we would put it on our website in a heartbeat, is we were listening to Led Zeppelin in one of our rooms, and he turned around me and he jumped out of his chair and he's like, good God, you've made a time machine. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, I didn't quite get that. And he goes, it's like I'm sitting in the room with Bonham and the boys. It must have been in English. Client and I was like, what? "Oh, oh, okay, yeah, I get that." And I love that that idea because it's kind of like we built a time machine. The recording, if the recording is good, you're you sit in one of our rooms and it's so real, according to our clients, that it's like you don't even have to close your eyes and you feel like you're just sitting there with the artist. Yeah. That's our goal. So, ninety percent science, yes, but the ten percent creativity trumps everything. It has to sound transparent and clear and invisible. But if it doesn't sound musical, we start again and we just make it so. You mentioned before that uh, you design also for the music. Does that mean that a design could change depending on the type of music that might be recorded in a particular, uh, a particular uh, venue, facility, studio? No. Um, what it means is that... Like Pandora did their research on music, um, like um, a musicologist would do their um, research on on instruments, right? We, as you know, as we go through the world, we listen to more and more music. Um, anybody I meet who plays a song, any car that drives by here, music. We we do a lot of listening. Mm-hmm. We do a lot of listening, and largely to music. 
We have lots of friends. Uh, like Richard is perfect. Richard Gibbs is a perfect example. He's got all... I don't even know what it's called. It's that little, like, wooden shell thing from Africa with a couple tines on it that go boing, 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 boing. Oh, gam- stuck, chameleons, yeah. Yeah, and he's, yeah. he stuck a transducer in it and put a quarter-inch cable in it so he can electrify it. Yeah. You know, he's got a million different instruments. The more you learn, you can design acoustics without having to understand music and people. Or you can design acoustics with understanding people, society, psycholo- psychology, and music and it makes it easier to design the acoustics because you understand why they do it, what instruments they use, how they play. It makes it easier to design a live room because I know that besides Bobby McFerrin, no one's going to stand in the corner and talk, sing into the wall, into the corner. You know, most people are going to sit in a chair, stand up, and, and most people aren't going to stand against the wall and play the guitar. They're going to just stand in the space. So we know we have a little free zone close to the wall or above six and a half feet. We design for the music because we love music and we're huge music fans. And we just spend all of our time learning about music, which helps us to design better acoustics. We know, we know our subject matter. Knowing the subject matter helps design the product better. The reason why I bring that up is, um, do you know Steve Brandon, the room tuner? Coco? Yeah. Coco Brandon? Sure. Of course. And, and Coco... <laughs> What's that? Who doesn't? Yeah, of course. And Coco would always say, well, it depends on the client, the way I tune. And, uh, you know, I have specific curves for R&B and specific curves for rock and and whatever the case, which I always found interesting. But, you know, he always has very, very happy clients. So no matter what he's doing, he's doing something, you know, that his clients love. So when you mentioned that, I thought there was a similar track where you might be designing for uh, the particular music, but it makes more sense if you don't, and, and any kind of music can work in a particular situation. That that makes much more sense, obviously. Well, and I agree with you. Coco does amazing work. Um, we've had many clients. We used to use them at Westlake sometimes. Um, I'm a big fan of Coco's work. Uh, many of our clients use Coco. Um, I think he does great work. He has a different job, though, because he goes into a pre-existing room, and he's at the whim of every great thing they did designing the room and every awful thing they did designing the room and whatever speakers, transducers they put in the room. So we're, we have a little less of an onus because we just have to deal with the content, and most of the time the clients ask us what kind of speakers to buy. They ask for our recommendations. So if we get to design the room and get to choose the speakers, the only thing really left is the content, which we can't control at all. You know, Coco does an amazing job with what he has to work with, which is everybody's rooms. Good, bad, ugly, <laughs> it doesn't matter. He's yeah, got to yeah. do it all. And so it does make sense. You brought up something else, too. He's got different EQs for rock and classical. Of course, that's, that's perfectly logical, and it works very well. Um, we, because we design the room and we're not stuck with someone else's room, we design to be neutral, acoustically transparent. So none of our rooms have any room EQ, not one of them. No room EQ and no bass traps and no bass buildup in the corners. And we, no bass traps, huh? No wow! Bass, you were uh, you were you've been to Universal. I have yes. Did you, stand, I just, did you stand in the corner? I can't say I did. Ah well, next time you do, you have to. According, according one of our things we're famous for is that in the corners there's no bass buildup because we figured out what causes bass buildup in corners and we simply went upstream of that issue and didn't let the issue happen at all. Oh uh, okay. It's the old joke about when you go to the doctor and. You know, you lift your left arm up and you go, oh, Doc, it really hurts when I lift my arm like this. And he goes, well, well, don't do that. (laughs) So we found out what causes bass buildup in corners and we said, don't do that. And we didn't do that. You know, I can't tell you exactly what it is. Obviously, that's a bit of a trade secret. But yeah, so, you know, we're going for neutrality. We're going for what's basically an acoustic cloak, which we're calling... Um, we have three different physicists who have um, come to us and said, after looking at our data, and said, basically, we're doing quantum acoustics. Wow. So I guess you would say that's the one thing that really separates you from other designers. And, and there's a lot of great ones out there. Of course. But, you know, you've taken acoustics, at the measurement, the, the science, you've taken it to another level, the way it sounds. And especially now with your panels, too, uh, ZR acoustic panels, it, it sounds like it, it's 
a a jump ahead, a leap ahead of everybody else. It's a, it's a whole different concept. Um, the way we call it is that we refer to traditional acoustics, which we used to do a bunch of traditional acoustics, and on occasion we'll still, you know, for certain clients, we'll do just isolation and a beautiful room. But we have taken it to a whole new level, yes. The idea, our attitude was, well, why should we live with one sweet spot? And why do I need to spend so much money on EQ, which no matter what you do with EQ, adds phase. I'm, I'm a huge fan of George Massenberg's. And, you know, years and years ago when he came out with his five-band you know, fully parametric EQ, he went on one of his classic Massenberg rants about, you know, speed and phase. Yeah. And I couldn't agree with that more. I just had a conversation with Wynn of Avalon, and he was, he was grinning at me when I looked at him and said, I'm a speed junkie. If you translate what we do into electronics, we want the fastest speed possible and we want everything, not 90%, everything in perfect phase. You want it fast and you want the phase to be perfect. And when you have that, everything starts to sound better. I love it's, it. Nature and science don't lie. I mean, why would electronics be concerned about speed and phase and acoustics not be? Con- of course it is. Automobiles are. Optics are. Light is. Why would sound not be? Of course it is. Nature and science rule. High resolution, speed, and phase make everything better. So we do a ton of research. We do materials research. We do thermodynamics research. We do quantum research. We do molecular research, chemical research. And, you know, a lot of that's wasted and goes nowhere, and a lot of it tells us enormous things, and we experiment and prototype. So we do a lot of science. The 90% science is a big bucket. And the 10% creativity is a lot of research in music, too. We have a lot of friends like Richard and other people who teach us about music and say, check this out. I did this recording in Tibet with, like, you know, an old F1 of this, like, yak moaning and saying, I'm like, what? And they're like, oh, yeah, check it out. And I'm like, all right. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I've never heard that before. And, and it teaches us something. So I think what sets us apart is we asked why harder than anybody else. We said we want a bigger sweet spot. We want rooms that can be any shape and size. We want the architects, whether they be us or another architect, to have free reign to build whatever they want, make, make it look stunning, any shape and size, and we'll make it sound like it's not even there. And that was not easy, nor is it still easy. It's, it's difficult, but it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Last question. What is the best piece of business to, advice that you've ever received or you learned yourself over the course of time? The best piece of business advice? Well, if I had to put it in layman's language, I would just say, make more money than you spend. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculously simple, but you can you can translate that into, you know, do your accounting well or get paid up front or, you know, vet your clients well. But in short, don't get too lost in your craft to forget that you still need to pay the bills. You know, I mean, you know, the old joke about drummers where they can't balance their checkbook. Well, you know, it, well, at least that's the one that I've heard a million times, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, I know a lot of really famous and really incredibly brilliant, savant, talented engineers, artists, creators, electronic designers who, and you know all the same ones that have gone bankrupt because of whatever reason. Um, but you just got to gotta be pragmatic about it and make sure you have more money than you spend. That's what I would say. That's great advice. Hanson, thank you so much for your time. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot from you, and, and this was terrific. It was everything I hoped it would be. Thank you so much, Bobby. I'm very, very happy to be here. To find out more about Hanson, go to his website at deltahdesign.com. That's Delta, D-E-L-T-A, the letter H, design. That's all one word, deltahdesign.com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or if you have any comments, Send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. I really like looking at your comments. I take them to heart. Whatever you have to say, good or bad, about the podcast, I read every single one of them. So keep the questions and comments coming. Many thanks to Steve Cherubino. He's the host of the EDM Producer Podcast at edmmr.com. 
and he puts this podcast together. Thank you, Steve. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes or Stitcher. At bobbyosinski.com, you'll find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>